Welcome to LCRL's Liberty Alert in Washington, D.C. with your host, Dr. Gregory Seltz. Talking to kingdom citizenship, bold biblical principles for a robust public Christian life. And now, your host, Dr. Gregory Seltz. Hello and welcome to LCRL's Liberty Alert. I'm Dr. Gregory Seltz and it is Wednesday, August 11th here in Washington, D.C. And again, we this is our weekly dive into living as two kingdom citizens in the world in which we live for the sake of the culture and for the sake of the mission of the church. You know, this is a time like we've been talking about for the last uh, couple of years where the church is being challenged as a legitimate witness in the world. There are forces in our culture, there's forces of rebellion in the spiritual uh, realm that are aligning to silence, you know, God's moral and God's gracious voice in the world. That's not an opinion. That's just what's happening. It's happening in litigation. It's happening in legislation. So, You know, one of the things I just want to make sure you understand, this is not an evangelism program. You know, I understand what it means to actually try to figure out ways to contextualize the gospel. This program is about dealing with the fundamental moral issues of a civil society and keeping the the state out of the church's business and the state out of uh, the lives of free people uh, of conscience. So... You know, this is actually trying to keep the church out of the crosshairs of the uh, of an overpowering, uh, tyrannical uh, state, and so we'll fight for the liberty to keep preaching the gospel. Uh, freely. Now, if that gets taken away, we're not going to stop preaching and teaching the whole counsel of God. And we do know that the day may come when it's more, more and more punitive to do that. But we need to understand, too, that we have a cultural mandate from the Scripture. I mean, we're, we're also supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to be part, part of God's preserving work as part of his saving work. And so today, the challenge, I think, for us is to say to people of goodwill— Speak up um, about these issues. Our culture really needs you. So people of goodwill, it's time to speak out, especially if you care for your neighbors. Speak the truth in love. Speak God's moral truth in love as well. And we hear all the time about that we need structural change and and we need to bring uh, these structures to their knees. Uh, No, the problem with structural, the people that are destroying structures is they don't know how to rebuild anything. And you're going to see that once uh, the structures are brought to their knees. There's no reason why we can't you know, deal with structural problems, deal with structural challenges, but uh, the biggest issue still is the human heart, and they deny all of that. That's why Romans 13 is so important. You know, Caesar was not a perfect leader back in the day. And when Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, Caesar's job was to just keep all hell from breaking loose. And he sometimes did it in a very forceful way. Uh, I just just read uh, an author and historian named Tom Holland, and he's a Christian. I mean, excuse me, he's an atheist who, you know, he has he makes no bones about the fact that he's not an advocate for Christianity. But he talks about studying the ancient world, and he said the ancients were cruel, their values utterly foreign to him. The Spartans routinely murdered imperfect children. The bodies of slaves were treated like outlets for physical pleasure of those in power. Infanticide was infanticide was common. The poor and the weak had no right. So how did we get from there to where we are today? He said it was Christianity. Holland, again, who's an atheist, said Christianity revolutionized sex and marriage, demanded that men control themselves and prohibited all forms of rape. It confined sexuality within monogamy, which is an, uh, an incredible blessing to both women and to children. And Christianity elevated women. In fact, it utterly transformed the world. And so for those of you who are Christian, who now are being told that we're the the root cause of all the problems in the world, you got to fight back because the world will descend into the chaos from which it came. So people of goodwill, speak up, speak the truth in love, because God really wants to bless even as he says no, he wants to bless even as he says yes. 
And so we'll talk a little bit about some strategies to how to do that today, too. Thanks again so much for your prayerful support. Um, if you would love to continue to see our voice can grow here in Washington, D.C., go to our, our webpage, lcrlfreedom.org, lcrlfreedom.org, and you can uh, donate there online. And we sure do appreciate it because, again, um, you know, the people that we're dealing with are well-funded, and uh, they've got all kinds of uh, staffing folks all over the, the cap. Capital, and and we're we're bringing the truth, um, but oftentimes we're bringing the truth, uh, you know, with a, a handful of voices. But that doesn't mean that the truth can't uh, do its job. So we'll keep up our work. Appreciate all the support for those of you who are partnering with us today and always. Uh, and we will put these resources to work for the sake of protecting our churches, our schools, and our universities. So again, today we're talking about people of goodwill speak up. You know, one of the things that I have uh, really appreciated about, and you know, it doesn't always have to be from a Christian perspective, but from a perspective of, of that, that understands fundamental truths of humanity. Thomas Sowell does a lot of writing about this, and he tends to write about this from uh, an, an evidence-based perspective. And what he, what he tends to do then is he talks about how government solutions to major problems don't work very often. And that the better thing is for free people to uh, to uh, tackle these problems in freedom, uh, to tackle these problems with their own ingenuity, uh, in their own families, motivated by their faith. You know, he, he talks about how those tend to be the, the better places to actually attack some of the big issues uh, in our culture. Now, when he attacks some of these or when he, when he deals with some of the issues, especially the political issues and political solutions, he tells us to ask three questions. He says, if someone gives you a solution, say, compared to what? And then say, at what cost? And then do you have any hard data to support your premise? And one of my favorite um, talk show hosts, Larry Elder, who now is running for governor of California, he he's a, a soul fan, obviously, and, and he talks like that, too. Even one of his talks, he was talking about uh, you know systemic police brutality, and he said, based on what? And he started to talk about the numbers, the statistics, and he said there's other factors that are really troubling um, our urban communities. And so he, he, he literally brings facts to bear on these things so that we can talk about real solutions. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't have rogue cops here and there, and that doesn't mean that we don't have some issues like that that we have to deal with. But he said, you know, I, I'm all for dealing with the problem, but you first of all got to define the problem accurately so that we can actually see what we're up against so in fact elder in one of his uh, writings said would it be helpful if officers wore body cams absolutely can training be improved absolutely let's focus on those things as well as rebuilding the family in the urban community and he said we're going to see um, success in ways that we haven't seen before so again that's just something to keep in mind even as we talk about the kinds of things we talk about in this preserving work of God in the community. Another article that I'm going to post this one, it's, uh, uh, I love um, Bob Woodson, and he's part of the 1776 problem, or 1776 project um, that's dealing with the 1619 challenges. And Woodson's the director of the Woodson Center, founder of National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. Um, he, he's been a, a civil rights activist, a black civil rights activist all of his life. And I love what he said. He said, America does not have a race problem. It has a grace problem. And so, you know, check out what he's talking about, about the solutions uh, to the issues that we're talking about. Critical race theory, like we talked about, my biggest issue is it's, it's the wrong solution. It may define the problem, but it, it, the solutions are the things that are problematic in critical race theory. And uh, black liberation theology, it doesn't liberate black people. And, and that's by the data. That's that's not that's not an opinion. It's by the data, and uh, you know Woodson actually talks about the fact that the black community was actually striving and um, uh, thriving going into the Civil Rights Act uh, in the 1960s, and it was he called he literally says that the kind of secular progressive sociologists then took over the the mantra uh, of the urban problems, and he said they have literally wreaked havoc 
in in the black community in ways um, that that even Jim Crow never did. So again, he talks about these things about real solutions, and one of the things he points out is that you know the black community went from you know relatively similar illegitimacy issues like the white community and the Hispanic community to now being at seventy or eighty percent. And he said, but what we found out is in the thirty percent of the black urban communities where people are keeping their families together. He said the Christian worldview and the Christian moral teachings of the Bible are strong, and they're actually helping uh, overcome some of these challenges that even the uh, even the folks who've got great intentions but bad policies um, uh, <laughs> are wreaking on their community. So it's a great article, again, talking about, uh, I love how he said, we don't have a race problem as much as we have a grace problem. We're jettisoning uh, the moral and gracious teachings of the scripture to our peril. So again, I I point out to you, you've got a lot of positive things you can say, even as you defend the teachings of the scripture, even as you um, defend God's moral ordering of the world and all those things, there's real blessing in that. So Liberty Alert today is people of goodwill, um, have courage. Keep speaking the truth in love. Now, I don't know if you watch the Olympics, but uh, I'm, I'm just telling you there's a lot of amazing things they didn't tell you. Again, it just shows how there's a narrative that they want to they want to get across to you. But there were just some incredible uh, performances. Sydney McLaughlin and her testimony. Not only was she a phenomenal runner and everything, but her testimony. Let me start off, she said, by saying, it's an honor to be able to represent not only my country, but the kingdom of God. And what I have in Christ is far greater than what I don't have and have or don't have in my life. And she was even talking about her records and how it's great, you know, wonderful. She wants to strive for excellence. But what a testimony. Then Suni Lee, uh, who stepped up after Simone Biles stepped down, you know, whatever you say about Simone Biles, I mean, uh, the pressure must have been incredible. She's a phenomenal uh, gymnast, but she did step away, and it put tremendous pressure on the team. And Suni Lee stepped up, and what a great story that is, and we're not hearing enough about that story. Um, the Hmong community, you know, fleeing from real persecution, fleeing to America, and then her father's sacrifice, her parents' sacrifice, and then she steps up after this, the, the chaos of the moment, and she, she really does um, our country proud. And if you remember the Grand Torino movie uh, about the Hmong community in, Minnesota, in Minneapolis, and, you know, uh, um, the whole discussion is how did the Hmong, you know, come to America? And uh, she says, well, the Lutherans brought us. And then, you know, uh, uh, the, the statement is made, yeah, everybody blames the Lutherans. So, you know, even we've even got a kind of a stake in this. And I remember uh, the pastors I, I was privileged to serve when I was training pastors for urban ministry. There's a lot of Hmong pastors, Hmong Lutheran pastors in, in Minneapolis who were part of our cross-cultural ministry center training. Um, and I know you all are proud. I saw the parade, and I had a friend of mine uh, text me a picture of the parade celebrating Suni Lee. And then uh, Tamara Mensa Stock and her testimony. And, you know, and then, of course, I love the Inga Brixen story. Um, but I actually love the ones, uh, the McLaughlin, Suni Lee, and, and Mensa Stock. And those are some incredible testimonies. And, and those are things we can, can uh, revel in um, now that the Olympics is behind us. Now, one of the things that we did do last week, too, or, or actually two weeks ago, was the Finnish consulate protest. Um, Pastor Poihala from Finland and Minister President Rossinen, uh, they have been charged in Finland with this law called the Ethnic Agitation Law, where because they teach uh, and, and have, have made public statements about traditional marriage and uh, sexuality f- and sexual practice from a biblical point of view, uh, they've been charged with ethnic agitation. And they could face up to, you know, I think it's two to six years in prison just for believing traditional biblical morality. Well, we're, I call those secular blasphemy laws. I got a chance to talk to the folks in the consulate. They assured me that theirs is a tolerant nation. And I said, well, that I appreciate that, but I, I still don't understand how secular blasphemy laws are evidence of, of tolerance. But uh, we'll see what happens there, and we'll keep Pastor— uh, actually, he's the, the new bishop of the Lutheran Church there, at least the—not the national church, but the one we're in fellowship with. 
and uh, Minister Rawson, and um, again, we pray for their witness. So today, a call for courage of people of goodwill, um, God's will, for family, for neighbor, for church, for community, uh, to, to stand together, because God is God and not a God of disorder. And C.S. Lewis said it this way, you know, if after you've realized there's a moral law and a power behind that law and that you've broken that law and put yourself wrong with that power, it's after this and not a moment sooner that Christianity begins to talk. But those moral laws are already at force, even if you don't know the God who created you and redeemed you. And so it's part of our job as Christians to contend for the moral truths of Scripture in service to our culture and in service to sharing the gospel. Now, one of the things that I, I've been talking to a, a couple of politicians here on the Hill, and one of the things that they keep saying to me is, you know, we've been caricatured uh, as if we're just the conservative movement and all that that means. He said, we've got to speak our the, the truth of the scripture so that both liberals and conservatives understand that this is, this is uh, something we can gather uh, together on in terms of what's the role of government in our lives. And I think he's absolutely right there. But the problem is, is that we're not dealing, we're, this is not a liberal conservative issue. This is a secular progressive versus liberal and conservatives. Even those of you who are liberal-minded, and, and, and again, I'm not going to get into the caricatures of liberalism and conservatism and all that kind of stuff. That's not for this program. But classic liberals believe that there were fundamentals. Classic liberals believe that there were fundamental truths in society. They may have had a different strategy for how to implement those truths, or they may have thought that government can be more involved in some things than, than they were. But generally speaking, liberals and conservatives classically in America believed in the fundamental ideals of America. That's what's being dispensed with today. The secular progressives, um, are, are they'll dispense with the classical liberals as well as the classical conservatives, too. And so that's why I ask you all, our, our way of dealing with this stuff is to call people of goodwill to speak up, because we're speaking the truth of God, and that truth of God is even written in the hearts of, of those who don't even believe in God. There's a moral sense, and so there are foundational truths of Scripture that undergird things like universal human dignity, unalienable rights, that under, uh, undergird things like the fact that we're created male and female and, and why we need to learn how to come to grips with what that means. The institution of marriage is a fundamental institution, not just a relationship in society. And then there's the facts of issues at hand at the moment. Those are the two kind of definitions. Those are the two truths we've got to struggle with. But, but again, we never relinquish the fundamental truths for the truth of the moment. Um, there are facts of the moment and there are enduring truths. And those enduring truths give us wisdom to deal with what's going on today. You know, again, I don't want to, uh, I'm not picking on Simone Biles, but she came out today and said something that was just, you know, I just think it was ridiculous. And she talked about how she's pro-choice because she thinks the foster care system is broken. <laughs> so the foster care system, which was a benefit to her, which also, she's actually saying, you know what, it'd be better for the, the mothers to kill their kids rather than to birth them and put them in the foster care system. Well, that, that's one of those things where if you, the fundamental truth should have said, you should know better than that. You don't kill children because you've got a bad foster care system. Um, I just saw that quote today and I thought, man, man, you know, again, we're a society that's just unmoored from, from fundamental truths. So I think we're at a point of courage in our country. And, and we either believe that God, you know, created the world and that, that this world is a moral world uh, or not. Uh, we either believe that God's gracious offer of mercy in Christ is on his terms, or we don't. And we either believe that these things are for all people, or they're not. So it's a moment of courage for those who hold those truths to be, to be dear. We can stand, therefore we can stand for people's civil rights, and we can stand against the BLM organization that is anti-family, anti-Christian, radical LGBTQ, uh, sexual libertine, and radical abortion. And anti-police. We can stand against all of that and still stand for civil rights. You know, in, in politics, I'm beginning to realize that uh, 
people say some of the craziest things in politics. I heard a politician this this last week who said that he's he's against the secular progressive defund the police movement. But he's a secular progressive. He actually says it's the conservatives who want to defund the police. And he said it with a straight face. I said, you know, own you can't be on both sides of the issue. Own the issue. And we've talked about this issue um, at length here. Uh, we can stand up for parents, pastors, preachers, professors, teachers. We can stand up and, uh, you know, even as we stand against police brutality. And like we've talked about, when police brutality or when, when there's too many police in a community— we, we, we're limited government people. We don't think things should be done by force. That's not the best way to do things. But if you have a less police presence, you have to have a stronger family presence. It's, it's just, that's just written into the nature of things. And so again, you know, um, we can stand up for these things even, and we, even as we stand against other things. Uh, we can talk about rebuilding family, decentralizing education, even, uh, uh when people say that somehow those things are caricatured as being uh, anti-urban and anti-poor, they're not. So again, you know, learning how to voice these things is going to take courage in the libertine culture uh, of today. And then finally, I think we can support peaceful protests and um, and uh, and we can talk about having riots put down for the sake of peaceful citizens. You know, because Romans 13 talks about the role of government as keeping the peace. We're in an Orwellian moment. Um, rage is never a godly solution, and Caesar has a role to play, and people of goodwill should not be the ones that are afraid. And then finally, the pandemic stuff, you know. Um, gosh, it, it seems like it's coming back um, you know, when we talk about this new variant, I say no more FOGO, no more F-O-G-O, no more fear of going outside, uh, no more of that. Uh, we're baptized people. We've already died with Christ. We've risen with Christ in this new variant, um, and it still could wreak havoc in our culture, but it should not stop us from living. So let's put the knowledge that we know, let's put our First Amendment freedoms that we have Let's put the church uh, in its proper place as an essential organization um, that has a message even to those who get the, the virus. It's at the point of being near death where the church has the greatest voice, and, and we need to, you know, again, fight for that essential uh, reality that that's the voice that really matters when we're really struggling. So people of goodwill who believe in God's will in this in the world and, and believe in his will and his word on his terms, it's more important than ever to speak up. Now, the last thing I just want to tell you again, I, I was just revisiting some research on the Bostock ruling, which is the sex, sexual orientation ruling um, of, of last year. And again, you know, th this is an incredible shock to the system of our culture because the Supreme Court decided to resolve something that it shouldn't be resolving. Um, these kind of issues should be legislated or, in fact, I'm not even sure if they should be legislated because they actually are First Amendment conscience issues. And what they did is they had literally created the notion, the, state, the stated notion that sexual orientation is equivalent to sexual biology. And so in, in literally one fell swoop, the differentiation between male and female learning to actually value um, our differences, even while we hold uh, male and female co-equal, and uh, even though they're different, that beautiful thing that actually f is, is a fundamental principle of a civil society is being undermined by this new sexual orientation, gender identity, and, and how it works its way out is going to really shock people when we start to see uh, how it, again, makes women vulnerable, children vulnerable, uh, and maybe men um, superfluous. I don't know if that will happen. But again, there's some real dangerous issues coming down the pipe. And the church has a, a, has a responsibility to speak of God's moral ordering of the world because the world depends on it. So a couple of things in, in, in closing. Um, here's where the church wants to be in this constitutional republic. 
We believe the Bible speaks to the truth of human dignity and brokenness. And that's a universal human condition. We believe in the gift of sexual activity best celebrated in the mutual love of husband, wife, and child. Um, we believe that these things, if they're unmoored from marriage, sex can become a very destructive force in society. All you got to look at is the STD numbers, the divorce, the poverty, the violence, and all these kind of, and the communities today. Th- those are facts that attest to the destruction we're bringing upon ourselves. We understand the view of sex and marriage is one rooted in God's creation of men and women who are differentiated yet co-equal, one flesh, and it's, um, that's to be celebrated. And we believe there's ample evidence sociologically, psychologically, historically that this is a viable viewpoint and it has a place in society. We're just asking that we, that we should have the constitutional protections to disagree with the libertinism of our culture. And the SCOTUS ruling on uh, Bostick at the Harris Funeral Home is outrageous because it relegates Christian citizens to second-class status in our world, and we're beginning to see what the legislation continuation of that, like the Equality Act and some of the Supreme Court uh, issues that are going to come down from this, um, we're going to start to see uh, this codify into very punitive law unless we start pushing back at this point. So it doesn't change our mission. I get that. Um, you know, it just may make our mission one that is going to suffer more persecution uh, in, in the days to come. Um, bad civil law uh, never ultimately gets in the way of us trying to speak the truth of God in love. But this is our Dred Scott moment. Um, you know, when Gorsuch, uh, in essence, said that Christian citizens have no rights that libertine secular citizens are bound to respect. He's wrong. He's absolutely wrong. And the Christian worldview, as we talked about before, has been the foundation to some of the most tolerant uh, nation states that the world has ever known. And you give up that fundamental foundational worldview, and you will start to see um, the barbarism of humanity uh, again like we've never seen before. So again, when we talked about the... um, the SCOTUS ruling back in Bostock, again, they created, they, they made a conscience issue. They, they, be, they made it uh, now a force of law rather than letting people free to disagree. And we need to stand against that as well. So in closing, you know, how are we going to deal with this stuff? You know, what are some strategies? Uh, how should we think about these kinds of things? Um, well, first of all, you know, again, what we say is the Supreme Court doesn't determine conscience issues. That's why the First Amendment was written in the first place. And so we're not going to put our trust in politicians, and we're we're thankfully going to put our trust not only in God, but even now we can still put our trust in a government that sees religious liberty and conscience rights as fundamental to a free society. Uh, I don't know how long our society is going to actually value that, but for now it actually does, and we can put that to work, and we can defend that. Um, We need to take our stand on God's moral law. This is not just for our protection. We're not just trying to get our way. If God creates and redeems us, I mean, if God creates us, he he, morally orders us, that's also for our own good. And so honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. All these things are fundamental to a civil society. Even if your heart's not in it, and you know, even following just merely the outward manifestation of God's God's moral law, there's there's civil blessings to that. We're a more humane culture if we do, um, you know, to that degree. Like I, I've always said before, a lot of times people when they drive to work or when they drive to a particular event or something, they'll say, "Well, I didn't drive the speed limit, but I drove it close. I drove as close to it as I possibly could, and I didn't run any red lights, and I didn't." I said, "Well." Your heart may not have been in it. You may have wanted to be like on the Autobahn. You may have wanted to be like driving 100 miles an hour, but you obeyed the law, and because you did, even though your heart wasn't in it, and this is not, you know, it's not a saving work whatsoever, but it did civilize uh, the culture if everybody would do the same thing. It would make it a whole lot easier to get around town. So take your stand on God's moral law, not just for your protection, but because you do love your neighbor and you love others, even those with whom you disagree. And then judge others by their action, not by their intentions. Elect those who will be faithful in word and deed. And when it comes to 
politics. All we're asking, even for people with whom we disagree on policy, we want them to um, defend religious liberty, to defend the sanctity of life, to defend the institution of marriage as something that a free society can can uh, disagree on. Um, so our view can be a public view in society, and to, to litigate against that or to legislate against that is an overstepping of the bounds of what it means to be a politician. And then finally, for those of you, if you, you know, when it comes to these kinds of issues, it's up to us to write our senators, our congressmen, write the White House, the Department of Justice, if they're not going to uh, abide by what the main role of the government is, which is to keep the peace and to be... Uh, um, Good referees who who are who are, are refereeing a game um, with no malice towards either team. Um, if they won't do that, then we're the ones that have to hold them accountable to that. I would say the last thing to do too is get your kids out of public school. <laughs> um, if you want to, I, I keep telling you the book uh, "Get Out Now: Why You Should, you should Pull Your Kids from Public School." Um, the rise. Uh, I just read an article that the rise of homeschooling and um, uh, charter schooling is is exploding in the uh, black and Hispanic community because they're beginning to realize that the values that they hold dear are not being given to their children in school, and it's undermining uh, it, not only their families but their culture as well. And and I've seen that all along, and so people are waking up to this. People of all ethnicities are beginning to wake up to this. And I think decentralizing the school system, you know our, our view on this. I think parental choice is the way to go. I think it's the most humane way to do this, to take the power, put it back in the, the hands of, of uh, the parents, black, white, Hispanic, any, all ethnicities. Um, the, it's the parents who have the responsibility to raise up their kids virtuously. And, and they should have the first yes or the first no as to where their kids go to school. And then the final thing is get back to church, folks. Um, the message of the good news of the gospel, but also the moral message of, of God, it, it, the wisdom of God, it, it'll blow you away. Read the book of Proverbs, too. I mean, we don't usually read the book of Proverbs because it temp- tends to be about temporal wisdom, about earthly wisdom, you know, and, and again, that kind of wisdom doesn't save per se, um, but it may it points us to the one who is the foundation of all wisdom for sure. But the Bible is, is it makes you know there there's all kinds of things in the Scripture, even sanctified common sense that can be a blessing uh, toward the culture in which we live. And we need to be people who hold the truths of the Scripture dear. So, in the middle of this chaos, and it's a chaotic world again. Uh, in some sense, the, the, the newspapers say things have settled down, but in, in reality, the chaos is extending uh, much further right now. We need to be a people who are firm in our convictions, but are wise in our actions, who are motivated by our faithfulness to God, who loves all people, who preserves a sinful, rebellious world so that everyone can hear about his salvation. So we want to be useful in his hands. And by the way, if you're a church that wants to host a... Um, Liberty Weekend, a Champions for Liberty Weekend. Uh, I think we're almost booked all the way through Christmas right now. But uh, go to our webpage and you can see the the Champions for Liberty um, a part of our webpage. And you can t- go to that tab and you can sign up or at least request us to do that, especially into the new year as we get ready uh, for the uh, election season of, of 2022. But again, our, our Liberty Weekends, are I think, are really important again because we begin to see that God is the one who's the source of all true liberty and how we can learn how to put our temporal liberties to work for the sake of the eternal liberties of Christ. Finally, then, pray for our country, pray for us in D.C., and we will continue to pray for you. Till we see him again face to face, speak the truth in love with humility and grace, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Until next time, God richly bless you. I'm Gregory Seltz. Have a great day.